Savior is the one who is exalted on high, having humbled himself unto the death of the cross. He has been given that name which is above every name. He has been seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, ruling over all things for our good. And so we are confident in the midst of the days that it is uh, well with us, that it is uh, good for thy uh, people throughout the world, that whatever the malice of the evil one and the hostility of of uh, unbelief uh, against uh, thy people, uh, that we are protected of thee and uh, that the gospel is going forth in the power of the one who has bound the evil one, that he cannot uh, stop the progress of that gospel <coughs> to the ends of the earth. And we know, therefore, that uh, being part of his kingdom, we are part of a kingdom which shall endure forever, that therefore our labors, even day by day, as well as across the years, are not in vain. Help us, therefore, to uh, serve thee this day with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, uh, with uh, confidence uh, that thy hand of blessing is upon us as we uh, serve thee in the name of the beloved one, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, undertake for us in this class, we pray thee, to open up the scriptures. We thank thee for the revelation of the one who was the anointed one, uh, the one who would be cut off in order to establish uh, uh, the covenant uh, of salvation with his people. We thank thee that we, we serve him who has first loved us. Now then, bless us, lift up thy name in our hearts and before our vision, and equip us for the task of proclaiming Christ to the ends of the earth. We pray in his name. Amen. We had uh, begun our study of the book of Daniel uh, by looking at the question of the <coughs> authorship and date. And in that connection, then, there's the matter of the integrity of the book, the unity of the book, uh, modern views, uh, while dating the finished form in the second century, uh, don't accept the, the, the unity of the book. They think of it as composed uh, by bits and parts uh, put together over a period of time. And so I think it's useful to uh, look at the structure of the book and to see the indications within it of, of structural unity. And uh, to that extent, uh, uh, I think we have support for the, you know, for, for the Bible's own representations that this is the work of the one author, Daniel. And uh, at the same time, then, uh, to see the, the structure of the book, I think, uh, leads us into the heart of the uh, message of uh, the book. And. Uh, so what I have in mind doing now is trying to show how, viewed from the point of view of, of certain criteria, the book divides itself uh, between chapters of 6 and 7, and on the other hand, considered from the point of view of other criteria, uh, the uh, di division uh, is one that connects chapter 7 with what, what goes uh, before. And the, the result is that chapter seven forms sort of a bridge or a link between the two parts of the book and, and ties them together. And uh, to, together uh, uh, with certain chiastic structures, we'll see that uh, at the end of the story that uh, uh, that chapter seven is, is sort of a uh, a, a link, the middle point between what's going on uh, back in, in chapter two and what's going on at, at the, the very end of uh, uh, at the very end of the book. And, uh, and, and this section will involve chiasms. This section will involve chiasms. But chapter seven is sort of uh, the, the linchpin of the thing, and we want to see how that works out now. And the first criterion then that we uh, consider is, is that of the uh, arrangement of the material by the dates of the different uh, kings and what we find then that in, in terms of this chronology we begin with, uh, with material that's dated in the reign of the Babylonian Empire the first four chapters uh, under Nebuchadnezzar so one through four under Nebuchadnezzar. And then chapter 5 is Belshazzar. And uh, then in the 6th uh, chapter, 
we move on to the Persian Empire. You remember how in the fifth chapter is the account of the fall of Belshazzar and how Cyrus the Persian, whom we are identifying with Darius the Mede, takes over, and that's what you have in chapter six. So, um, things go in, in sequence uh, up to that point, but then when we come to chapter seven, and, and indicative of, of this break that we're establishing now, in chapter seven, things are back in uh, the Babylonian period once again, under uh, Belshazzar. And uh, both chapters seven and eight, and then once again, it moves on to the Persian period. In, uh, in chapters 9 through 12. So in, in terms of the chronological sequence, the dividing point is there between uh, uh, chapters uh, 6 and 7. 7 goes with what uh, follows. A second criterion that results in this same division is that of the sort of the, the style, the genre of the thing. If you can think about the first six chapters for a moment, uh, what you have there is clearly a series of narratives, is it not? Third person narratives. Whereas in, in chapters 7 through 12, you have a series of uh, visions, first, first person visions. Not to be sure, you, you have a vision in, uh, in uh, the first part, the, the Nebuchadnezzar's vision. What unites uh, these is that these are Daniel's visions. Daniel's visions, and uh, so uh, in terms of Daniel's own uh, role in, in the first uh, uh, six chapters, uh, what is emphasized is his uh, role as the, the wise man, the sage, and, and, and the, the court counselor in the court of the, the pagan kings. But then his, his role, a lot like Joseph in, in Egypt, is more Daniel's role in the first six chapters in these narratives. Uh, whereas in the latter part, you might compare more to the, the Apostle John, the, the, the seer of the New Testament apocalypse, as, as Daniel uh, has this a series of, of visions. So in terms of chronology, the break comes here. In terms of, of, of the style, uh, we have it at this point. And uh, now following up a little more precisely on these narratives <coughs> and showing the unity of them, which then has the effect of cutting it off here once again, uh, let, let's uh, notice the nature of these narratives, third-person narratives, but more especially, and this is something important then to see in terms of your understanding <coughs> of the book and its message and its, and its uh, uh, purpose, but what kind of narratives are these? That they are ordeal narratives. Uh, the situation, of course, of Daniel and his three friends is uh, they find themselves at this uh, utterly low point in the history of the uh, of the covenant uh, uh, people, and uh, it seems to the world certainly that uh, that the God of Israel has not been uh, powerful enough to <coughs> to protect his own people and keep them in their own homeland because here the nations of the world have taken over and destroyed their homeland and, and, and carried them captive. And it is precisely at this point that there's a, a crying need for a, a, a message of theodicy, a message of, of the defense of God and, and, and his ways in the, the world. And uh, that is very much what the, the book of Daniel I is doing. And it doesn't happen just in, in words, but it happens in, in, uh, in, in deeds. It, it happens in, in uh, uh, in God stretching forth his hand and, and delivering uh, his servants or, or vindicating them in a series of ordeals in, in which uh, Daniel and the three friends are, are pitted against uh, the, the world power and its wise ones and, and its powerful ones. It, it's very much what Paul does uh, then uh, later on where he is establishing the thesis uh, that, the, that the, the wisdom, uh, that the foolishness of God and the gospel is uh, wiser than the wisdom of the world, and the weakness of the gospel is more powerful than uh, the, the powerful uh, of the world, and, and uh, that's what be is being established by the Lord through his servants Daniel and his free friends in the series of, uh, of ordeals. Now, the ordeals themselves are also arranged in a striking way uh, that shows the, the integrity of chapters 1 through 6 as a unit viewed from this perspective. So we, we have two... Uh, 
we have two sets, two tri two triads of uh, or, or deals. Uh, you know, in the first three chapters, the first triad, and then in the second, the, uh, the second triad. And uh, in each case, we have. We have a, a pair of wisdom contests, chapters one and two, will be the wisdom contest. And then uh, chapter three, and, and again, the chapters uh, four and five will be wisdom contests. And then uh, in uh, chapter three and in chapter six, we have a, a physical ordeal of some kind. So this is a neat little pattern then of these two triads, each one set up in the same way. Well, what are we talking about? Wisdom contests and, and, and physical ordeals. Uh, chapter one, chapter one is, is something of a physical ordeal too. Remember, there, there's the test of what food they're going to eat and, and, the, and uh, the, the Hebrew lads uh, come out the helper and all with uh, uh, having not involved themselves with the king's fair, but whatever the nature of the diet they were involved in. But the, the real contest uh, that's involved there is, is the one of knowledge, is it not? They have been trained in all of the wisdom there. And of course, there is the famous uh, reputation of, of the, the wise men of, of, of the world and, and all kinds of particular uh, uh, specializations uh, in the, the wise men in, in the court, and they're all present, and, and they all fail in, uh, as over against the, the, uh, the young uh, Hebrew lads when it comes to this test of knowledge, where the Hebrew lads show themselves much more wise. So in that, that's chapter one, a, a wisdom ordeal. And by the way, uh, in the literature of uh, uh, the times uh, from there, uh, we have the genre of the wisdom contest, mm -hmm. where it was a popular thing in the courts to, for the, the wise men to be engaged in this kind of contest. And, and the, the, there are, are, are different Aramaic texts, text, for example, that uh, are set up in the format of, of, of wisdom uh, contests. And uh, now then, what's going on, of course, here is uh, the, that the Lord is showing the, the, that he and his people are wiser than the world out there for all of their, their fame. And, and uh, each of these victories and ordeal, as you move along, results in, in God evoking from uh, the, the mouth of the pagan leaders themselves some acknowledgement uh, of the superiority of the Lord and of his people uh, to themselves. And so the, the, the theodicy is getting across there. God's name is being vindicated, it's being demonstrated that in spite of appearances, his people being subjugated by, by the world, uh, that uh, the, this... It does not mean that the Lord is not the, the Almighty. He is, and he demonstrates it in, in, uh, in, in this way. Well, what's the second chapter? And that's supposed to be now a, a second wisdom contest, and clearly it is. And uh, this is, of course, the one where Nebuchadnezzar has the dream, and he calls in all of his court of wise men, and they're not able to handle it, but Daniel does. So here, here is a, a wisdom test, a, a wisdom contest, a wisdom ordeal in which uh, Daniel uh, prevails. Then... Climaxing the, the first triad, there is a physical ordeal. And of course, the idea of ordeal in the ancient judicial process uh, that did often involve some sort of, uh, of, of physical contest, whether uh, actual combat between the, the two rival claimants in the judicial case, or at least the, the confrontation or the exposure of, of the, the, the one party, the accused, to some ordeal element, and the favorite illustration I keep coming back to all times that, uh, for example, the second law in the Code of Hammurabi, where uh, the, the one who has been accused goes down to the divine river and uh, has to cast themselves into the, the river, and, and the river is conceived of that as a god who pronounces the, the judgment, either by sparing the life of the one cast in there or by drowning them. Uh, but that, that's the, the river ordeal. That's comparable and, and to, of course, the symbolism of baptism and uh, tying things you know, together. And, and, but there are all kinds of other physical ordeals. There were, uh, in terms of individual combat, uh, there, 
uh, that there was wrestling. You know, the, the two rival parties would, were, would engage in belt wrestling. Uh, and it might seem an odd way to settle it, but actually there are, these are legal texts that, that speak about it. For example, this one where, I think it's from the Newsy text, where uh, a couple of brothers are, are contesting uh, their inheritance of rights, and uh, they, they go at it by, by the, the wrestling belt technique, and seems to be two falls out of three or something to that, to that effect. The idea is to rip the belt off, it, which, which is, uh, in, uh, in some of the artistic renderings in, in some of the Egyptian texts, I think it is, it, you can see the picture of the sequence of, 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 of the wrestling. And uh, so the, that, that was another technique. Well, what, what's the ordeal in this case? Uh, of course, it's the, it's, uh, the uh, fiery furnace. So uh, exposing the, the, the accused either to uh, uh, water or fire, huh? the, the, the most common ordeal elements, water and, uh, and fire. And in this case, of course, it was uh, uh, fire. And uh, the usual... Uh, Dynamics, the procedures of, of the ordeal uh, come out, uh, which are, of course, to the effect then that uh, the, the one who accuses someone else falsely becomes uh, subject to the judgment that that would have befallen uh, the, the party they accused if the, the accusation had substantiated. And uh, so here it, it develops too that the, the Babylonians are the ones uh, who are destroyed in by the, the, the fire of the furnace rather than Daniel and his. Uh, friends there. So there is the, the first triad. Now we come to the, the second triad and uh, once again it begins uh, with uh, a couple of wisdom contests or, or a deal. Chapter 4, chapter uh, uh, yeah, chapter 4 would be the madness of, uh, uh, the, yeah, of, of Nebuchadnezzar which involved again a dream and uh, which the others are not able to in, in, interpret, uh, but Daniel can. So I, I, think, I don't know if I jumped over chapter two, which was Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, did I jump over chapter two, uh, which was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Daniel interpreted. Okay. And in chapter four, then we have another dream uh, that, that uh, Daniel in, in, interprets, and with uh, the, the very unhappy results uh, for Nebuchadnezzar himself, which is. Uh, uh, the, undergoes this uh, affliction, whatever it is. Harrison, uh, in his introduction, he had some medical background, evidently, and he gives us a, a little technical analysis of what the particular disease uh, what was that you know, overcame the king. But in any case, it was uh, uh, Daniel, once again, who proves himself the only one who can interpret uh, that uh, dream, and it all falls out accordingly. And as I said before, in case after case, these episodes result in some a pronouncement uh, of the king uh, uh, honoring the, the God of Israel or, or, or some uh, promotion of, of God's uh, servants, uh, but in each case, uh, God's name is being vindicated along the way. Then the second of, uh, of these uh, wisdom contests in, in the second triad here, this will be chapter five, is a, a little different. It's, it's the enigmatic script, uh, the handwriting on, on the wall that none but uh, Daniel was able to decipher. But once again, it's clearly a matter of, of a, a wisdom contest uh, and uh, leading up then to the climactic third one. Uh, and once again, not the fire, but the lions this time uh, as Daniel is cast into the, the pit. Apparently the picture is out of a pit of, uh, of, of uh, uh, lions. And, and again, it's, it's the, the accusers who are destroyed by the lions and uh, the Daniel who uh, is uh, delivery, but now there is a, you know, the, a, a striking pattern. It's uh, certainly a deliberate the, the arrangement, and it unifies the first uh, uh, six uh, chapters. And with the result, then uh, that uh, chapter seven goes with uh, what follows. And uh, and what we were just saying mm -hmm. about trials by ordeal, I, I sh should be the kind of point that you are making when you're preaching on it, or when you're you're, you're teaching a a, a Sunday school class on, on this, uh, uh, the, the message that you should be conveying is uh, not there to dare to be a Daniel. That's not the point of, uh, of what's going on here. It's uh, the, the glory, uh, Father, the, the God of all wisdom and, and, and power. He is the true and living God. Whatever historical appearances to the contrary, 
uh, this is uh, the message and that it's, it's, uh, it's the, the triumph of the, of the Lord. It's, it's not the, the steadfastness of the Daniel that is uh, the, the uh, primary uh, message here. Well, now, in those terms, then, uh, in terms of chronology, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, genre, in, and in terms of, of this particular uh, literary pattern, uh, that's the way things uh, divide, and 7 through 12 go with what follows. But now what we want to see is that there's another set of criteria according to which uh, chapters 2 through 7, chapter 1 remains as a as an introductory chapter, and, and two through seven form a, a, a unit, and so the cutoff point is, is uh, here, and then eight through twelve would uh, be the rest. Now, the criteria that we're interested in uh, at this point, that the first one is that of language. We've spoken about the fact that the Book of Daniel is written in the two languages, uh, the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And in, in those terms, and that, that's a very clear and definite way the book is uh, divided. So it begins with Hebrew, and then actually, it's being more precise, it's chapter 2, verse 4, uh, where all, all of a sudden it, it, it takes us in, uh, into the Aramaic, and, and from 2, uh, 4, on uh, through chapter 7, uh, that's uh, it. So language then. Um, no, no, here we are. Uh, this is the, yeah, starting with two fours here. Okay. Chapter one is the Hebrew. Chapter one is the Hebrew, uh, and uh, two four through seven is, is the Aramaic, of course, and then eight through twelve is back to Hebrew. So, according to language, definitely chapter seven goes with what goes before, with the. Uh, uh, and uh, not with uh, what follows. And then closely related to the language, and we can put it this way, well, why the two languages uh, and uh, why the uh, particular allocation of, of them. And uh, here I think it's a question of, of, of theme. And we're going to see a unity of theme here as over against what we have here. And uh, the, the particular themes are, are in each case are more appropriate to the, the selected language. Now, Hebrew, of course, is the language of God's own people. Aramaic, as we said the other day, was the lingua franca. It was the language of international diplomacy. It was the language of the world. And corresponding to that, what you have is that in chapter 1, uh, it's, it's dealing with the, the disasters of God's own people. Now, now they, they uh, send their way through the, uh, the lawsuit, and, uh, and, of course, the book opens with uh, they're going into exile in the days of Daniel, at least this is the beginning of the exile. And, uh, well, when God's addressing people about their own sins and falls and, 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 and calamities, uh, he addresses them in their own language. This isn't the world's business. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, between God and his uh, people. But now, when you move on to chapter 2 and fall, right away in chapter 2, you're dealing with uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the, the world empire seen through his eyes. And, uh, uh, and uh, as you continue on through chapter 7, the whole story, and, and particularly when you come down again to the close, as well as at the beginning of chapter 7, as well as chapter 2, uh, the emphasis uh, is on not on God's judgment of his own people, but on God's judgment of the world empires, okay? And so the, this is a word of... Uh, of the Lord to, to the nations and uh, let, let them uh, hear it and let them hear it in their own language, the language of international diplomacy. <laughs> and, uh, and so you get the Aramaic. So there, and, and then when you come to chapters 8 through 12, uh, a, a more detailed outline of these chapters would uh, serve to make the point here, I think. Uh, but the point is that once again, uh, they're concerned very much with the, the sins and the falls and the judgment uh, of, of God's uh, own, own people and the, the calamities that would uh, be uh, befalling them uh, uh, for their covenant breaking and so on. And, uh, and so once again, it returns uh, as to deal with this theme with the language of God's own people, uh, with that of, of, of Hebrew. And, uh, and, and here again, as with chapters 1 through 6, 
you have a, a striking literary pattern that shows the, uh, the coherence of that. So here we have another striking literary pattern uh, sh showing the connection of chapters two through seven. And it's a chiastic pattern this time. So chapter uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and uh, the, the thing that of course signals it right away is, is the, the A sections, the, the first one and the last one, chapters two and seven are, are so uh, very much in parallel as the representations in each case of the four world kingdoms, uh, followed by the fifth kingdom representing the kingdom of God, which brings judgment upon uh, the, the kingdoms of, of the world. In chapter two, it's in terms of uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's own vision uh, of, of things with the, the image and so on. And in chapter 7, is of course, Daniel's vision. And uh, so what uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees as this impressive, uh, uh, fearful, uh, man-made uh, object is this uh, the thing that inspires awe and so on, the world empire, the image, seen through da Daniel's uh, eyes is quite the opposite. It isn't something almost uh, divine, it, it's, it's something bestial. Hmm? And uh, the point is coming across of, uh, here uh, that, uh, that the kings of the world uh, attempt to lift themselves up in their divine uh, kingship ideology uh, above the human. They seek to deify themselves. What do they accomplish in the process? They become subhuman, they become beast-like, they become bestial. And so the Daniel portrays them in terms of the reality of the thing. They, they just become a series of, of monsters, fearful, powerful, but at last uh, to be destroyed. But uh, that's very much then chapters uh, the two and seven. And, and so uh, the, those two certainly in, uh, correspond. Well, that brings us to the, the B sections there, which would be <coughs> chapters three and uh, six. And uh, it's interesting, the overlapping patterns that you get here. In the, the first pattern that we were talking about, three and six also corresponded, didn't they? Uh, chapters three and six were the two occasions of, of physical ordeals, the, the uh, uh, fiery furnace and, and uh, the uh, lion's den. And uh, so we, we know that they correspond in that formal way. And uh, analyze more the thematically, you might uh, analyze these two chapters as, the, as sort of the acts of the martyrs. Mm -hmm. In each case, there's, there's the, the, the witness to the Lord, uh, whether the three friends, chapter 3 of Daniel and chapter 6, uh, the, the, the witnesses for the Lord who are ready to give themselves in, in, uh, in uh, martyrdom. Of course, they are actually delivered in each case, but the correspondence of 3 and 6 is, is clear. And then that leaves us with the center visions, uh, 4 and 5, the 2C uh, sections. And uh, what's the unifying theme uh, here? Uh, chapter 4 was uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream uh, about how he was to be humbled and be like a beast of, of, of the field. And uh, chapter 5 is the, the humbling of Belshazzar. Belshazzar puts on this great uh, feast. He brings out the vessels of the Lord's temple and despises them and puts them to this <coughs> profane pagan uh, use. But before the night is over, the handwriting on the wall has been fulfilled and, and, uh, and his kingdom has been taken from him and it is destroyed and the Persians have taken uh, over. But there is the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, there's the humbling of Belshazzar in, in chapter uh, 5. And uh, the re total overall result then is this interesting chiastic structure. And, and once again, in chapter 7 in terms of this, it seems to go with uh, what goes before rather than what follows. And so I, the point of this, uh, we'll do a little bit more with chapters 8 through 12 here in a second. Uh, but the point of this, I, I think, is uh, that uh, it, it seems to show the, the literary, artistic, structuring uh, unity of one mind at, at, at work in a, a very uh, clever and able way in, in, uh, in developing these overlapping patterns uh, and uh, chapter 7 going with what goes before and with uh, what follows then serves to link the whole um, book uh, together. Now the the argument is, uh, is strengthened then further if we can just take the chiasm over here and uh, pursue it uh, 
in, in another one. This one will not be a, an ABC CBA. This will just be ABC, and the, cent the centerpiece has just the, the one unit. Uh, so sometimes in distinguishing different types of chiasms, if there's only one one unit uh, in the center like this, you might call it a, a delta uh, chiasm. But in any case, uh, the, that, that's chapter eight. And and then the center of it all is chapter 9. And then the next B section corresponding to chapter 8 would be chapter 10. And roughly, just for the moment, roughly chapter 11. And then the final A section would be chapter 12. And we'll want to show the, the, the correspondences that justify this arrangement. I say roughly it's chapters 10 and 11. The cutoff point comes somewhere late in, in chapter 11, and it depends on where you see the transition from uh, a description of second century BC events dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes and so on, where you see the transition between that and the jump to the figure of the man of sin, the Antichrist, because beginning was at chapter 11 verse 32 uh, or, or 36 I guess it's 32 is where Paul picks up uh, his quotation there in Thessalonians and uh, and interprets it in terms of the, the Antichrist figure the, the man of sin so uh, the, somewhere late in chapter 11 just depending uh, I say on where you see the shift the Old Testament uh, setting to the climax of the New Testament uh, eschatology uh, so let, let's just, uh, for the moment, maybe say verse 32, <coughs> uh, verse 36. And then the last section would begin at that cutoff point and extend through chapter 12. Uh, the, the correspondences uh, uh, here again are, are, are striking enough. And uh, what you'll find is that you know, chapter 2 is already concerned with, with final judgment and so on of the world. And chapter 7 is concerned with uh, the final judgment of, of uh, the little horn and, uh, and the beast power and so on. And of course, that is once again the theme uh, down here in the, the, the closing chapter of, of Daniel. And in, in connection with this, there are various uh, uh, other motifs that, that fill out uh, the, uh, the, the picture for us. Uh, the themes of, of uh, resurrection, final judgment, the Messiah figures. Uh, you, you get the, the Son of Man here. You get the Gabriel, uh, I mean the Michael figure down here corresponding uh, uh, to it. And, uh, and it, it very clearly is this, this ultimate eschatological uh, goal that is uh, depicted in, in, uh, in both passages. And uh, then, as I suggested earlier, what you get in the area in between where the language now shifts to Hebrew to accommodate itself to the fact that uh, here there's a lot of emphasis now on the, the, the judgment that's going to be befalling God's, God's own people. And so in chapter 8, uh, you have a, a, a focus on, on not the ultimate outcome of things, uh, but... Uh, the more intermediate stage of things that would be represented by the, uh, the uh, Persian kingdom and, and, and the Greek kingdom and, and, and uh, the calamities that would befall the, uh, the Hebrews, especially uh, under the, the, the Greeks uh, and Icus Epiphanes and so on. And uh, so that's what you get in chapter 8 and then again in, in chapter 10 and uh, 11. Up to that turning point in chapter 11 where it jumps to the end of history altogether, uh, it is very much dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes and his persecution of the Jews back in the uh, second century BC uh, with the involvement of the apostasy of, of, of God's own people that, that triggers uh, this uh, uh, calamity for them and so on. And uh, so that's the, the correspondence then between uh, eight and chapters 10 and 11, which leaves the 70 weeks passage. Now, that's the first one we're going to turn to, uh, the 70 weeks passage, is chapter 9. And you, you can see now, uh, just in terms of the structure of the, the, the book, what a centerpiece uh, the, this is, uh, everything uh, focusing on it. And uh, the, 
the perspective, as we said in chapter 7 and chapter 12, and already back in 2, 2, 7, and 12, uh, are corresponding end pieces of, of these two chiasms. And uh, so chapter 2 and, and 7 and, and chapter 12 uh, have this, as I said, range that takes you right down to the, the final judgment of, of uh, the, the world and, and, and the thought of the fullness of, of the fulfillment of God's uh, covenant promises to his uh, people. Whereas chapter 8 and chapter 10 and 11 have, as she said, more to do that with that theme of, of the failure of the old covenant works arrangement uh, and uh, more to do with the impending fall of Israel and so on. And chapter 9 combines them. Chapter 9 it is a combination of emphases. Uh, on the one hand, it, is, it brings out emphatically so. Uh, the, in fact, I guess the, <coughs> there's more of an emphasis, I, I, would, I would think, maybe almost in, in the 70 weeks passage on, on the fall of, of Israel. But, but uh, certainly that is there, the 70 AD event. Uh, but also along with it uh, is the, the, the ultimate perspective of chapters of the 7 and 12, the messianic victory, uh, and uh, but the, the the chiastic structure then uh, of uh, chapters seven through twelve, I think then lend further support to the argument for the overall unity of the structure of of the book, and in the totality of it, you can see how chapter seven is very much of a connecting point, and and it works in both ways to tie the character <laughs> together. Well, that I think. Uh, then that is supportive of the uh, view of the one author who, well, this, this just didn't happen by accident, these nice patterns didn't just happen by accident as, as pieces from here and there got stuck together by later redactors. It's much more natural explanation to see uh, one literary genius mind at, at work uh, uh, producing this. And so uh, th there's that higher critical apologetic value of seeing this. But uh, even more importantly, I think, is that uh, this is what the book's all about. Huh? The, the book is, uh, once again, uh, as the message of prophecy uh, elsewhere we've seen is, uh, is constantly all about two things. It's about the fall of Israel, and it's about the, the fullness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, here, with the role of the Messiah, very conspicuous. And indeed, although, as we uh, move on to a, uh, a discussion of chapter se uh, 9, and, and then we'll do something with chapter 2 and 7. That's about all we have time for. But uh, as we do that, we, of course, will uh, have an eye on, on the whole hermeneutical problem of, of dispensationalism, of, which has made so much out of this material, and not least, of course, out of the 70 uh, weeks passage. And so that will occupy us, and, it, and uh, rightly so, because this is something we encounter with a the people we're dealing w with out there in, the, in our in our churches, and we ha have to be able to to uh, know what they are, are, are thinking and, and what the problems are with their uh, with their, their dispensationalism. So yes, we, uh, we we have to do that. But uh, uh, hopefully, in, in in looking at that problem, it will not blind us to the the blazing reality of this the revelation of the Christ uh, who, who is found here. In, uh, in uh, that uh, image cut out of the mountain without hands that strikes uh, uh, the, the, the decisive blow and the figure of, of uh, the, the Son of Man uh, figure uh, comes in the Ancient of Days and receives the dominion and, and the glory. And of course, not least in, in, uh, in, in chapter 9, and, uh, and, and let's make sure we see this in, in chapter 9. And like the servant of, of the of the Lord, like other messianic uh, prophecies, it's it's the uh, it's the sufferings and the glory uh, again, sufferings and and the glory. Uh, that's what uh, the seventy weeks are all about. The the anointed one who, who will be coming and, and who has the sufferings of being cut off, and, and yet he is the he is the, the king of Israel who who brings the judgment of the covenant. And he, he is he is the priestly sacrifice, but he is the, also the, the royal judge uh, who who avenges uh, himself upon uh, the, the people who have refused him and, and so uh, he is the destroyer 
properly understood uh, these verses will be saying describe Messiah as the one who is the desolator of Jerusalem which has become an abomination of desolations and so he he brings desolation uh, uh, upon it and um, yet at the uh, at the same time he, uh, he, he is the, 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 the one who brings to pass the new Jerusalem mm -hmm. Uh, the building of the, the ultimate and, and the true uh, Jerusalem, but it, it's that full scope of, of, of messianic prophecy in the Bible that all uh, comes to a, a very uh, clear and distinctive uh, expression here. And so let's be looking for that and not just uh, uh, for poking in holes at dispensationalism. Well, that's easily done and we'll try to do it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> now then, Turning to this central vision, chapter 9, and this was one of the passages, I guess, that we had for required reading, so we'll be able to follow it easily, I trust. <laughs> There, there, are, there are so many particular details that would have brought out the correspondence still further. I trusted you on your own to just examine and that various things will, will, will strike you. For example, in chapters 8 and 10 and 12, the theophany over the waters is a very distinctive motif that occurs in both of those and so on and so on. Well, the 70 weeks passage. And uh, in the required reading, we began with verse 24. Uh, we'll start with verse 20 here to get uh, some of the immediate background. Uh, we want to see the connection, especially we don't want to isolate. We don't want to isolate this this prophecy of Gabriel uh, from the prayer of Daniel, the first whole part of this chapter is, of course, Daniel's prayer. And to understand the, the uh, 70 weeks prophecy, right, you have to see what's going on and what the uh, connection is. And uh, uh, starting with verse 20 will, will help us uh, uh, to do that. So let's look at verse uh, 20. And yet I was speaking and praying and mithwada, mithpa'il form from the verb yada. Now this, we're going to be <coughs> speaking about Kodak prayers here. From the verb yada, the noun and toda. And uh, using that as sort of a little technical term for the kind of prayer uh, that that Daniel was praying, and then this particular verb is the verb yada from which the toda. So while I was uh, yet speaking and praying, and and now what does yada mean? Well, it, it means to make a confession, and uh, the Hebrew, like the English, uh, it could mean either of two kinds of confession: confess sins. And that turns out to be very much what's going on here, of course, in Daniel's prayer. Uh, or you can, of course, make a, a confession of the name of God in a more uh, positive way. Well, here, here's the Toda prayer, which is a, an acknowledgment of, of sin, as it goes on to say quite specifically. Because it says, and while I was making confession of my sin, hmm? uh, but not just his personal sin, it appears here now that Daniel is sort of speaking as the voice of, of the whole exiled community, and uh, so he adds the sin also of my people Israel. And amplifying that still further, you now get the verb mapil, 
uh, if you'll participle from na fao, na fao itself means to fall, and so apparently in connection with uh, an utterance here, it's, it's, it's the making of the prayer uh, to, to fall. It's, uh, and uh, so presenting, while I was presenting then my, my prayer before the Lord my God, now the subject, what is the Daniel's particular concern here? It's Al Har Kodesh Elohai. Concerning the mountain of, and the Kodesh, uh, uh, throughout this context, I would be taking not just as a, a general adjective meaning holy, but as a concrete <coughs> uh, noun meaning the holy place, that is the temple, the sanctuary. And so uh, what Daniel's concern for here is Zion, the, the temple of, of, of God on, on Zion, which of course uh, lies in, in uh, ruins. And so this is, this is the subject of, of his prayer. And um, the background uh, for appreciating this uh, and, and the significance uh, of the prayer will be found in Leviticus 26. Now you may remember Leviticus 26 as a, a key passage uh, like Deuteron Deuteronomy 28 and 29 for the uh, articulation of the covenant blessings and, and, and curses. And so you read through Leviticus 26 and, and uh, there too, as in De Deuteronomy 28, you find yourself brought up to and into the disaster of, of, of the, the exile and, and uh, God's people just not able to do anything. And, uh, and uh, yet there, there's the turning point, I guess it's in, in verse 40, and uh, you, you check it out for yourself, but uh, just be before that or in, in connection with it, uh, the Lord has said now that when all of this has befallen them, uh, he will remember his covenant with Jacob, yes, his covenant with uh, Isaac, his covenant with Abraham, and, and so there will be a restoration uh, uh, for them. It's uh, like the Deuteronomy 30 thing, verse 1, when all of these things have come upon you, then uh, there's the, the new development. Well, Leviticus 26 uh, portrays things uh, the, the same uh, way. That then the, the God will intervene and, and, and he will restore his people, but the, the point is this restoration is, is tied in uh, with the fact then that then the people will do this. They will make their toda prayer, that they will confess their sin. You see, there will be that kind of repentance that Deuteronomy 30 uh, also described. Then you will turn, then you will come to your senses, you will repent, and so on. The same sort of thing in Deuteronomy 30 is in Leviticus 26. And, and so the restoration from uh, the diaspora is uh, made to depend upon uh, the, the the turning of the people in in confession and, and toda prayer uh, to the Lord and uh, so now we come to Daniel 9 and the curses of Leviticus 26 have, have befallen them they are in exile and uh, now Daniel opens the way for restoration by in the name of, of the whole people as it were making this toda confession and, and, and now the Lord they respond uh, with words of, of a restoration to them. And so verse 21, it goes on. And yet I was speaking in prayer, and the angel Gabriel here is called the Ish. They, they appear uh, to human beings in the guise of men, and so they're called the Ish. And so, and so the, the man, Gabriel, the angel, uh, Gabriel, Asher Raiti, whom I had seen in my vision at the first, he, we had reference to uh, uh, Gabriel was uh, back in chapter eight before this. Daniel's had come acquainted with uh, Gabriel and his involvement in this process of revelation, and uh, so this angel, whom he uh, he was already familiar with from the preceding vision. Now you get the verb mu'af, it's the, the hollow verb, the ayin bav verb u, which means to fly, and uh, followed by a, a, a word whose meaning is debated, but you can see uh, its similarity to the verb, uh, the, the um, uh, form mu'af, and I, I think it better not, not therefore to take it as sometimes in, in weariness, as if he uh, was weary flapping his wings to come to the scene, uh, 
but uh, as underscoring the speed with which he came. So he, uh, Daniel has begun to pray, and as we see that the Lord was saying, anxious to, to come quickly to Daniel and, and to assure him that his prayers were heard. As soon as he began to pray, in fact, uh, the answer w w was uh, on its way. And so what you're, we're looking for is the thought of urgency and, and haste, and not weariness. And uh, so the thought is then uh, that being made to fly rapidly in haste, uh, uh, the angel Gabriel, uh, Nogea, he, he reached me, the Cal participle Nogea, he reached me at the time of the evening oblation. So now here we are, are beginning to get a feel for the relationship between the, the prayer and uh, the prophecy. And uh, the, the prophecy then is one that, that will be uh, addressing itself to Daniel's immediate concerns, of course, concerning the restoration of the temple. And he will be assured that this is about to, to happen. Uh, but the prophecy goes beyond the, then the immediate concern of the Toda prayer itself. Daniel's concern <coughs> was with the fallen Jerusalem and, and temple. The message says there will be restoration at that level, at the typological level, but it doesn't stop there. It goes beyond and deals with uh, the messianic age, very much the same as in the case of Jesus and, and the, the disciples when <coughs> they are asking questions about, again, the fall in Jerusalem as predicted by, by Jesus. And uh, yet in his answer to that, the, the, the Lord doesn't stop with that. He doesn't uh, just uh, deal with 70 AD, uh, but he... He, he takes the disciples beyond that uh, to the, the, the parousia. So uh, uh, in, in each case, there is a, a prayer that is answered, and in each case, the answer takes us uh, beyond the immediate concerns of, of Daniel in the one case, of the uh, disciples in, uh, in uh, the other. Now, I think we'll stop there and take our five-minute break.